it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you tonight. I'm only sorry that I was not able to come today until the last session. I can see what a high quality event this is and I hope that I can add uh, to some of the rich discussion that is going on here today and tomorrow. I have my watch set here and I definitely want to leave time uh, to engage with you on issues that are of interest. I wanted to start with a quick note as I was driving down 81 today, I passed the uh, Massanutten Military Academy. And that's where I was on the morning of 9-11. I was taking a course called Hostile Environments. And it was taught by a group of retired Royal Marine commandos. And we were engaged in a hostage taking uh, scenario. So we were all being uh, hooded and taken away. They boarded our bus with flashbang grenades and took us off and went through this entire scenario uh, to really teach us how to deal with hostage, uh, the eventuality of being taken hostage. I was uh, at this course um, because I was actually interested in some of the technical knowledge they were going to impart about the uh, danger radiuses of various ordinances, how to determine uh, if a high velocity uh, rifle was being fired nearby or not, um, things like don't stand behind an RPG. So I was preparing for a new phase of my career. I had been actually spending uh, the previous decade out in Latin America, uh, where uh, with US News and World Report, I had followed the various insurgencies and actually spent time with most of the guerrilla uh, groups then active. The, um, uh, re most recently, I had spent a lot of time down in Colombia, uh, and I had been out both with the FARC, and the, the guerrilla group known as the FARC, as well as the um, Colombian uh, Marines and Army. So you might say I was a little belated in getting my hostage uh, taking training. Uh, but I was doing this because I had an opportunity that had opened up to uh, go back to Colombia with the special forces, the US special forces. And they had not done anything uh, like this before, take a reporter uh, down with them uh, to go out into the field in, in Colombia. Uh, of course, the term later became known as embedding, which I think is a terrible term. Uh, but I was um, permitted to go out and watch uh, their operations as they worked with the Colombian uh, military in uh, what was uh, 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 assistance to their counterinsurgency. Uh, it was not the US in the lead, it was the Colombian counterinsurgency, but that was a decade-long uh, endeavor that uh, produced uh, some fairly successful results, albeit, as you know, if you do follow Colombian news, the uh, arduous effort to negotiate a final peace accord um, was not approved by the Colombian population. So the president has uh, gone back to the um, uh, gone back to work on that, and we'll see if they're able to finally conclude what is um, one of the longest wars in the world. So I wanted to just tell you that anecdote because it reminded I was reminded of it as I drove down here today, but also just to give you a little bit of a snapshot of my. Uh, checkered career. So the first half was spent as a journalist and very largely out with um, uh, non-military folks, uh, uh, non-US military, either out with guerrilla groups. I was gravitating toward the small wars uh, end of the spectrum. Uh, I spent a lot of time with diplomats. I know my friend Ambassador Litt, I think, is here tonight. Uh, a lot of uh, ambassadors, and I came to know them as muddy boots diplomats. There were a lot of people out there working in the conflict zones uh, who did not wear the uniform, and I came to respect uh, very much what they did. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, of course, uh, lots of people in um, primarily that first decade in Latin America. But I always um, was impressed to see how these countries that many people uh, felt did not have a democratic vocation were clawing their way towards democracy. And most of the region is solidly democratic today. And that taught me a very important lesson about how to make judgments and how to look at factors and try to take into account um, what I think of as the 360 view to reporting or researching. 
Uh, it, you must invest the time to seeking out all of the points of view. And that leads me, I think, to some of the, the points I'll make about strategic leadership. And as you all um, e either continue with your careers or uh, embark on your careers that will uh, have you being strategic leaders at various levels. I'd like to offer you uh, a few thoughts from both uh, the field observations of the more recent years, uh, but also the work uh, that we did to try to synthesize a broader understanding with a group of stakeholders that was the report that Colonel Gray mentioned, Improving Strategic Competence Lessons from 13 Years of War. And I believe that I'm, my function here tonight is to kind of serve as a bridge between your discussions today and tomorrow. And what I thought I would do is just pull out three of the lessons from this Improving Strategic Competence Report, illustrate them with a couple of examples, and then open up to uh, whatever comments uh, and questions that you, you would like to make. This uh, work, the Improving Strategic Competence Report, is online. I also have copies, hard copies, that I can mail if you're interested. We did this um, with certainly a lot of research into government documents and other reports that had been produced. The chairman uh, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dempsey at the time, had produced, had had his staff produce a first volume uh, called Decade of War. And that was a very good compendium of, of previously prepared reports, but it was at the operational and, and tactical level. You've heard, I believe, earlier today from Rich Hooker, who um, was the lead author or editor of the follow-on volume, which extracted some strategic level um, lessons. And we, we came out a year, a year or so before, and I was on the review committee for his book. And so I think this is just a critically important endeavor for uh, everyone of this generation to try to make sure we understand as fully as possible what we've been through. And I often use the metaphor of the blind man and the elephant because you, there are many people that are convinced uh, that they know the truth because they were in one place at one time for one tour or because they came from a certain uh, faction of, of the country uh, in conflict, et cetera. And I just, I, I find that it's important for us to continue to strive to gain that holistic uh, insight. So what we did was we gathered, uh, I believe it was 20 senior leaders, uh, uniformed and not, those who served in the, both the Republican administration and the Democratic administration, a cross-section, not just from DOD, but from state, from USAID. So we tried to put together a very carefully matrix group uh, of individuals, and we, we carefully prepared each session and sort of walked through what we felt were the key decision junctures and heard from them and had them go at it, go at each other, and, and really talk through some of these issues. And I won't say, uh, because we did this in a non-attribution way, we did not sign the document with all of those participants because we felt if we produced a consensus document, we'd have to water it down. What we did was we took what we felt were those primary insights that rose up to the top and synthesized seven uh, lessons. And then we had seven recommendations that we felt flowed from those. So I, I invite you, if you're interested, uh, to look at the entire report. What I'm going to do is just mention three of the lessons uh, and provide a little insight about things that I saw in the field that uh, tended to support those conclusions. So these are high level uh, uh, comments. We're, we're trying to really reach up to the very highest level of how governments, nations decide to go to war ultimately, but also just how they fashion the national security strategy. And we found that the making of national security strategy has suffered from a lack of understanding and application of strategic art. And that's a fairly harsh judgment uh, to render, and that may be considered, I mean, all of these are, are open to debate, but that we uh, felt was an important lesson to put out there. Uh, and as you know from your studies, the um, joint uh, definition for a strategy is a prudent set of ideas for employing instruments of national power in synchronized and integrated fashion. So right away, this is telegraphing. We're not just talking about the military instrument of power. It is about this fine art of weaving together all national in instruments of power. 
And it also requires being clear about identifying what are your priorities, your assumptions, uh, aligning your ends or your objectives with resources, uh, reaching decisions, but also as critically, choosing what not to do, but doing so in a conscious manner. Um, I, I think that the, um, perhaps the most insightful description of strategy that we came across was Sir Hugh Strawn. If you know, he is, uh, well, until recently, he was at the Oxford University's Changing Character of War program. He's now at St. Andrews in Scotland. Uh, really a giant of a thinker, and I commend to you all of the work that has been produced through that program. Uh, but his um, comment was that strategy at, at its heart is an adaptive art for coping with the uncertainties of war and the lack of perfect knowledge. And I think that is really the point. There's no clear right answer. This is a terribly difficult and consequential business to fashion strategy. And what I have learned by observing uh, leaders throughout these years and wrestling with these issues is that it's almost a disqualifying statement to say, it's easy, I know what's right. The task of leadership is making your best guess through a deliberate uh, process and then being willing and able to adjust as you go. So I will refer to General Petraeus. I know there was talk about him earlier today. He had a lot of bumper stickers that he used to convey basic principles. And uh, I think it was a very effective communication tool. So the way he would summarize this constantly was get the big ideas right. That is really what he saw as his number one task. The intellectual leadership was get the big ideas right. Of course, he didn't do it on his own, and I'll have, have more to say about that um, in just a minute. The big idea I would submit with regard to Iraq, the big idea that he had was the reconciliation was the key to lasting success there. And as you know, that is still a goal that has not yet been achieved. There was also a vision of how you get there, and that's through decentralization. So that's the way. Now you might note that the end and the way don't, aren't, aren't uh, subject to US agency. All the US can try to do is midwife it. And I'm sure you had a robust uh, debate about that today. And of course, there is the perennial question of how many resources uh, blood and treasure do you put toward that uh, endeavor? What are the means that you're willing to use? And I always object when people think about the surge first and foremost, as that term would connote, as numbers. It was, what was achieved there in that time period was as more importantly due to how those troops were used than the numbers. And we can have a debate about that when we uh, get into discussion. Uh, in the second lesson, our second lesson from this report was an integrated civilian military process is necessary, but a necessary but not sufficient condition of effective national security policy and strategy. And this, again, this can sound like a platitude or a homily, but uh, it is, again, I'll go back to this, all instruments of national power. So it is not just a military endeavor, it is perforce uh, a, a, a combined team, an interagency team that has to do it. Of course, we have a system where it is a civilian-run government, and at the end of the day, the decisions are made by the civilians. Uh, what you, I believe what we've seen over uh, the past two the Bush administration and the Obama administration was in the Obama administration, there was a reaction, an attempt to sort of reclaim some space from the military. And the civilians wanted to make very clear that they were not devolving that decision-making power to the military. Yes, they needed the military assessments. Yes, they needed the military resource judgments. Uh, but at the end of the day, the decisions rested with the civilian uh, and above all, our, our commander in chief civilian um, elected uh, president. So the mechanism, what happened was the, the idea that all decisions had to come, had to be made in the White House 
a pernicious effect began, an unintended effect, I believe, began to take hold as the National Security Council staff grew and grew to over 400 people. Tactical and operational decisions were being made at the White House. So in an attempt to try to control the process and not be um, influenced in untoward ways by the military expertise, you had, I think, a very unproductive uh, mechanism uh, process take place. There was also, I, I don't know if we're in a civil military crisis or not, but let's at least say there have been frictions. And uh, I think that General Dempsey as chairman uh, tried to repair some of that. I think that it's still a work in progress. And I would commend to you uh, an article by Janine Davison about the civil military decision-making process. She's currently the undersecretary of the Navy, but she was an academic when she wrote this. And I think it's the, one of the best characterizations of the mental models that civilians and, and military um, officials use as they approach this question of strategy and how you get to decisions. The problem, though, at the end of the day has been, I believe, this um, focus on the minutia. Its critical cost has been there is little time for strategic thought. Senior officials are caught up debating which d drone strikes uh, to approve. They're caught up in the minutia, and there are endless rounds of interagency policy committee, deputies committee. These meetings just churn endlessly, and there's literally no space or time for strategy and strategic thinking to occur. Um, I am... Um, I'm trying to decide how far into the weeds to get here. It is so uh, tempting to go back through all the bad decisions that have been made, but you've been spending, I think, a good bit of the day um, doing that. Uh, I think it's more important to look at what, what we found on the positive side. There were ideas about uh, inculcating in military doctrine the fact that there is no linear process of establishing an end state, and then you go through this kind of deliberate and mechanical process of, of, of planning. It's a dialogue. Uh, it's a dialogue that has to be subject to red teaming, to contrarian voices, and uh, tabletop exercises, but people have to actively seek out contrary views and then evaluate them in a deliberate process. I will say uh, the key decision of Iraq should have been subjected to that um, uh, process, and I believe you've already talked about that earlier, but I did want to get my oar in the water on that because I think that early on, if you had identified you were going to go in and do regime change, you had two choices. You had to do stabilization either through the indigenous forces, i.e. keep the Iraqi military intact and use it while you're trying to reform it, or be ready with major 100,000 plus peacekeeping forces uh, trained and directed to do that. And I was out with the forces, and they had no such mandate to do that. In fact, I was shocked. I was out on the border uh, near Kut on the, uh, between Iraq and uh, uh, Iran, and we have just you know Iranians and returning Iraqi expats flooding across the border. And we had uh, the early um, you know, Shia uh, militia groups had taken control of the city of Kut, and there were all, seeds of all kinds of mayhem ready there. This was, you know, April, March 03. And so it was, it was patently obvious to anyone on the ground there that there had to be a phase four plan and there wasn't. So that to me is just a dumb dumb. Please let's not do that again. Uh, lesson three, military campaigns must be based on a political strategy because military operations take place in a political environment. So again, you might say, well, duh, Linda. But we really have been unable, uh, I think, collectively. When I say we, I speak as a US citizen very invested in trying to understand this. But I will say I think the US military has been very reluctant uh, to, to grapple with the political nature of war. And you'll hear tons about this from, if General McMasters is coming tomorrow, you'll hear tons about this from him. Uh, but this is, 
Um, I, I interviewed uh, Gen uh, Chairman uh, Pete Pace uh, in the course of trying to deliberate over the way ahead in Iraq pre-surge, and, and I asked him about the political role uh, in, in counterinsurgency, and he said, no, we don't. He just flatly said, no, we don't do that. Um, I, I think that we owe it to ourselves to understand that our acts in another country are political. We have to do our best to understand uh, that country. We have to literally develop a theory of the conflict what is driving it, and what we can do about it, and what the limits are. I'll give you a quick example, uh, leapfrogging forward to Afghanistan, uh, because I spent a lot of time there as well. And the way I look at it is there were two competing theories of what was causing that uh, conflict. There was what I'll call the Sarah Chase theory of uh, conflict. She was an advisor to General McChrystal. Uh, she was actually also a former journalist uh, for NPR, spent a lot of time in Afghanistan, very close to the Karzai's. Her view was corruption was causing the conflict and that uh, we, our US actions, were fueling the warlordism. I believe you'll hear some of that view from General uh, McMaster. I came around to subscribing to another view of the conflict that Tom Barfield, one of our US, our premier American academic experts uh, in Afghanistan, he's an anthropologist, has spent many, many years there. And his view was that the, the Afghan government that we set up through the bond process was a centralized institution that we were attempting to impose on a highly regionalized country. And that like it or not, the actual political reality of that country was regional centers of power led by, yes, warlords. You can call them what you like, power brokers, but that was the reality of uh, Afghanistan and we needed to deal with it. So. I would note example number one, Ashraf Ghani, the president now, who is a former World Bank um, official. He's a true expert in every sense of the word, highly westernized Afga uh, Afghan. He chose uh, Dostum, uh, one of the warlords, as his running mate, as vice presidential running mate. He recognized that he had to get that contingent of the population on his side. He also reached under, well, after a lot of um, a drama, power sharing agreement with Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, uh, the key representative of the Tajik population and the Northern Alliance, which we had partnered with to take down uh, the Taliban in the early days. And, you know, it's just, I believe, important to understand where countries are. And we can't become social engineers. We must adopt an attitude of humility and understand the pace at which societies change. To me, it's not an option to go and intervene in a country and refuse to deal with that fact of what is this country's makeup, how does it operate, how can we influence it, and to be both humble and sophisticated about what we're trying to achieve in a given time frame. I'm a very happy to report to you that the newly published in August, the uh, joint publication 3-07, Stability, so it's the joint um, doctrine for stability, now includes a diagram that puts political strategy at its proper central place. Um, it's also, I think, a very um, sophisticated document that incorporates a lot of insights about what the U.S. can and can't do, what joint, what military roles are, vice civilian roles, uh, and I'm very hopeful that this work will not be lost because if you notice, what's fallen out of our dialogue and our lexicon? Counterinsurgency and stabilization. The U.S. Central Command doesn't even use the word stabilization to talk about what's happening, what's going to happen in Mosul after uh, the Islamic State gets pushed out. They're calling it normalization. That shows you how we, we put we put words in the ash bin of history and we fail to really grapple with, it still has to be done. We may have not done it well. How do we get about doing it later? And I salute the panel before that delved into some of this. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm uh, repeating some obvious insights there. Um, I, I want to say that um, having observed uh, General Petraeus in the uh, field a lot, I think a couple of observations. I've talked a lot about high strategy, but this stuff really does apply at every level. And General Petraeus was, took great pains 
uh, to make sure he built a team, a team of experts, and that he always included younger people in his circle, and he spent a great deal of time at the company level. And indeed, I would say, I'm not going to put words in his mouth, of course, that wouldn't be, he's perfectly happy to put words in his own mouth, but pushing power down, uh, it's called mission command, you all are probably familiar with the term, um, this is really the way wars have to be fought. Uh, relying on the sensitivity, the understanding, the preparation, the sophistication of the younger officers. And of course that was, when I referred to the surge, the real point there was pushing that power down to those company uh, commanders and to those small groups of people out in the joint security stations in the neighborhood. Get to the know, know the neighborhood. Figure out who are the good guys and the bad guys. Try to understand the dynamics there. And in the case of forming the Sons of Iraq, you know, bring, reach out to them, take some risk, assume some risk. They're the ones that are going to be uh, here when we go, and if we don't understand how they can start bringing uh, security to their local areas, it's, it's not going to happen. And he did the same when he went to Afghanistan. I believe you had some dialogue about Afghanistan, but I will just say he came away from the Iraq experience with this same optic. So when the Special Operations Forces came and said to him, we want to do village stability operations and raise Afghan local police. We want to get the locals to start securing their own areas. We want them to be picked by the local uh, tribal leaders. We want them to be vetted by those local tribal leaders and overseen by those local tribal leaders. So it was very much, I think, this bottom-up approach that does emerge from these wars as one of the key lessons. And of course, now we have the bumper sticker, by, with, and through. And you'll see a lot of people talking about what we're trying to do in Iraq and Syria now is by, with, and through those local forces. Some informal forces, some duly constituted forces. Of course, this term comes from the special uh, forces lexicon, and this is what they've been um, doing for quite a while. We don't know how this will end, so I have to say my book title still has an asterisk on it, uh, but I do think that the model of uh, trying to empower the, the locals who will, after all, own the problem long after we're gone is, generally speaking, the better way to go. The, all the details of how it's done uh, I think there are many experts here who, like me, have spent many, many hours. I will say I think we went badly wrong in empowering the Syrian Kurds as much as we did. We've given them to believe that we're going to back their uh, bid for autonomy, if not statehood. That is going to cause Turkey uh, to be a unrelenting thorn in our sides. And it was a tactical expedient move with long-term strategic consequences. Not the least of which, of course, is the Syrian Arabs are kind of sitting on the sidelines, sitting on the fence. And if we're going to make um, this two-country war uh, come out reasonably well, those are some of the problems that uh, we need to have uh, more focused attention on. I've, I think I've run out the clock and then some. Let me stop here. I'm uh, really very willing to, to take any um, questions, comments, challenges, and on any, any aspect that you're concerned with or that I may have mentioned. Thank you. And by agreement with uh, Colonel Gray, I'm going to just call on my, uh, my own um, interlocutors here. So please stand up, wave your hand, or just start talking if I don't see you. <laughs> I think th there are two mics, uh, or one mic perhaps. There. I, and here, yes. Thank you. A question. The uh, Joint Forces Command and later the Joint Staff J7 <clears throat> and JACOA's Decade of War Study, I think you referred to. I think the central theme there was uh, we didn't understand the operational environment. So would you agree that we, would we be understanding the operational environment in Syria if we partnered with the Russians and the Syrians against ISIS? Over. <sighs> Yes, thank you. And that's thank you for giving the full provenance of that report. So JACOA um, absolutely was the great institution that did a series of reports. And our other four lessons of the seven that we drew does 
uh, I think, hammer on this idea that we have got to understand, uh, we have to have the expertise and the history, the culture, the languages. That's part of the operational environment. I think there's always going to be kind of the hard sciences, the understanding the red, the enemy. We just, I think, really have to keep uh, working on ensuring we have that more holistic understanding of the operating environment to include all of the actors uh, that are playing. I have, um, and I, I did publish an unclassified report on the counter-ISO campaign assessment, and it is very tempting. So my big view of where we've been is we were in maximalist mode with the Bush administration, uh, and a, a degree of overreach. Now we've swung back to minimalism, and I think the lesson of this administration will be uh, the risk of inaction or the price of inaction. So in an attempt to parse and contain U.S. activity and investment, the decision was made we're doing counter ISIL. We're not taking on, okay, we're going to say Syria, Assad should go, but we're not really going to do that much there. We're going to treat this Syria problem set as one that can be bifurcated. And of course, we see, just as the uh, gentleman was saying, we couldn't ignore Syria because we've got the worst refugee crisis in our, our history. It, trying to treat ISIL in a vacuum, I think, is bad. I would say partnering with Russia right now is bad because the wrong signals will be given for reasons much beyond Syria. So for many reasons, I think Syria is the problem that cannot be ignored, and the next administration is going to have to deal with it, unfortunately. I know I have many, many colleagues who, who still dispute that, and they see the easy button as, let's just accept Assad's well on his way to consolidation of at least the populated Western Corridor, Russia's in there, you know, warships on the move, Aleppo will probably fall before the next administration comes in. I mean, it's going to be very, very difficult situation. But I would argue that siding with them um, will not buy stability in Syria. And we may have lost a lot of the Syrian population's confidence, but it has been shocking to me how the op moderate opposition has survived. And I know they get Gulf state support, and you know I know that they have uh, their lifelines, but at the end of the day, people control the ground. Those of you in the ground forces, which are the preponderance here, you understand who controls the ground. And what is, what is Assad relying on primarily? Uh, the Iranian-led NDF militia, Iraqi Shia militia, Lebanese Hezbollah, and a, a shell of an uh, a Syrian army, most of which decamped and joined the moderate opposition. So I think we'd be on the wrong side of history. I'm sorry for the long-winded answer, but I feel pretty strongly about this. We talk about uh, having um, this interagency cooperation uh, as part of any sort of military operation. Um, how do we organize that cooperation? This, uh, we, when I was there, we tried to actually uh, institute a deliberate planning process similar to what the lim uh, military does for the interagency with responsibilities that are fairly well, but generally delineated, et cetera. Uh, but how do you get sort of a deployable uh, force from other agencies to come and apply their expertise uh, instead of just turning it over to the military, which in the end are, are unqualified to do a lot of the tasks that we ask them to do? How do we do that? Thank you, uh, General. That's a great question, and I uh, we just um, the reason I was late today is we actually just delivered our thoughts to the um, Pentagon on this because they are rewriting the Stabilization Directive 3000.05, and they they may get it signed before um, the um, administration changes, but if not, it will be teed up 
uh, for the next one and hopefully, hopefully won't get lost in the shuffle. But the current directive, which was really born out of this experience of, and the military tends to say the civilians didn't show up. I think that's a little pejorative, but let us just say the military got involved in doing a lot of things for which it did not have the competence or training, but at the end of the day, you put your men in uniform and women in uniform out there to do uh, the jobs that must be done. So as a result, the 3000.05 has eight tasks in it. The, only the first one is security, ensuring civilian security and civilian control. So that means in the first case, you have to put your people out and, and make the population uh, safe, but it also means transitioning and doing this critical task of raising or improving the indigenous security uh, forces and then some aspects of the rule of law system. So we came out, this is, it's not approved or published, so you should probably not talk about it, but our position, which will be published and it's unclassified, um, is that the military really needs to focus on this core security function. And I believe as we heard in the panel before, you can't really get the other tasks to happen until you've got a sufficiently secure situation. Now, if there are young military age males running around, they probably need some cash for work programs to keep them from going into the insurgency or otherwise making trouble. But what we're trying to do is scope back what the military role is and then improve through refinement the support it provides to the civilians. And I actually have, we were, I was surprised by um, the degree to which international agencies can actually do a lot of logistics and more cheaply than hiring the, because they have to pay back the US military for the, the lift and the, the logistics help. They actually have uh, a pretty good system uh, for doing it. Also, there was a, a belated, a benighted effort to build a stabilization unit at the State Department. This, in my view, really does belong to USAID. Uh, I think that state has a planning role and state has a role looking at the political, using its expertise to look at the political conflicts and work on that. And the rump element, the Conflict and Stabilization Bureau, is actually migrating toward that. And now I'm getting a little bureaucratic here, but I think that needs to be owned by the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. I think that needs to be his planning unit to farm out to the regional bureaus to literally have a conflict uh, a stabilization plan from the political element. There's also this problem where you've got state plans, USAID plans, and military plans, and never the, you know, thrice will meet. I mean, it's just crazy. So you need some mechanism to cut across that. And I, so sort of zooming up to the top level, I think that re, uh, promulgating something like PDD 56, which was the White House saying, you will have a Paul Mill implementation plan and you will do. And I think you've got to get to that. Uh, the author of that is someone who could potentially be a next uh, high ranking administration official. So perhaps that person will get dusted off and put it out again. But I think there has to be some directive from the White House. And even though I criticize the White House National Security Council staff for getting so large, there are lots of models at that level of workable, the Eisenhower model. I mean, I think we have to have a functioning um, National Security Council system, but then at the operational level, you've got to have these, um, you know, we, we, I have friends who've been very frustrated and they say there is no whole of government. You know, we're all working in our own little bureaucratic stovepipe. I, I, unfortunately, I've never served in government. I kind of have a horror of the endless chain of meetings. I, I like to try to study the problems from the outside, but I think it is imperative through a very a mandatory program, the same way Goldwater Nichols solved the joint the, the service rivalries, you have to, I think, get very serious about personnel serving tours in each other's bureaucracies and cultivating that one team spirit. And we've all seen it, it happens out in the field. When you're out there under fire, you're in a command and you're working 24 seven and living in the dust and eating at the chow hall, you are going to collaborate. We just have to get some of those Washington mechanisms working and people have written about them time and again, but we just need the leadership to put it right up there at the top of the list. Yes, Ambassador. Thanks, Linda. From your lips to God's ear on PDD 56, I agree with that. Uh, the question is about security sector reform, and I guess it's uh, PPD 23. Um, will this have legs? Uh, personally, I think it's a, a valuable contribution of uh, 
of uh, various agencies, including the military. Will it have legs in, into the new administration, or do you think it's going to die? As with all of these things, it takes someone really believing in its importance. And I am, I have been, I gave a lecture at the Army War College a couple of years ago and pointed out how all of our high level policy guidance documents give, uh, underline the importance of security force assistance, but there is no real mechanism um, to do it, and that is that is a core military function. And I have to say, you know, this emphasis on fighting and winning the nation's wars, if you don't win the peace, and if you don't empower those who own, are gonna be there for the long haul in a professional way, and I think the example, you know, I've been, I've been thoroughly acquainted with what we were able to do in Colombia, the same in uh, the Philippines, although they have just elected a very kooky president. Uh, but we long-term partnerships pay off, and I would just like to see a little more put behind that. Now, I know that General Milley, the Chief of Staff of the Army, does has announced they have a plan to build security force assistance brigades, but it's going to be one by next year in active duty, one in the National Guard, full operating capacity sometime in the distant future. Uh, and, and I think that that is very important. There are programs also for institutional um, advisory capacity, ministries of defense and so forth. The other big problem, as you are so well aware, is we have this bureaucratic rivalry between state and defense about who does security assistance. And I'm actually, General Caslin could write the book, maybe he will write the book on this. Um, and we need to uh, figure our way out of that. Of course, what's happened in these war years is DOD has had more and more of the 1200 series and other types of funding, but it has to be integrated as part of the fo overall foreign assistance uh, plan. And I, I don't, I, what we have now is certainly not right, but I think that 23, PPD 23 is the beginning, but it's, it's not enough and no one can get, this is a big battle. Someone has to make this a priority or it's not gonna happen. Yes, sir. He'll bring you the mic so I can hear you. Uh, Cadet Sutherland, West Point. You talk a lot about mission command, empowering the lower units, companies on the ground. You also talked about empowering local governments and militias using special forces. What do you think the appropriate combination is on the ground, so as we approaching officership uh, yeah. to understand that question. Yes. Um, I The last uh, trade book I wrote was The 100 Victories, um, which if you know your Sun Tzu, I'm not talking literally about 100 victories. <laughs> so um, the book is about the Village Stability Operations Program, and I think that was the most thoughtful uh, approach to uh, formulating a program to raise informal forces. Now, of course, the last time anything was done at that scale was in Vietnam uh, with the civilian regular uh, defense group, and the Marines had a, a companion uh, program. But this really did rely on identifying those key village elders and relying on them to know who were the young men in the village that could be trusted and and their role was defensive and their role was local. There were a lot of controls, but they weren't controls that couldn't be implemented, which is the other thing the diplomat who spoke uh, earlier, you know, we can design these Cadillac programs, but if they're not sustainable, forget it. So the whole idea is how do you work through uh, their own customs and methods. And I think that really represented kind of an arc for the special forces in Afghanistan. They had gone in uh, with the Northern Alliance, married up with them, along with the CIA, their two great CIA histories about their role because they were able to deliver the cash right away. They had that authority. Um, and they used the guys on the ground and it really didn't matter who they were. And Golaga Shurzai down in Kandahar, um, you know, characters, to put it mildly. So you want to try to pick the best of the best. That doesn't mean you can create a Abe Lincoln or George Washington where there is none. But as I saw this program, and I was very, I went to all, all the provinces where the program was occurring, and then I spent uh, weeks and weeks at selected locations 
over the period of 18 months so I could watch how the individual effort w evolved. And I think that it really does represent a model. Now, it's very hard to do. It took quite a lot of their bandwidth. Um, but if you want to do it right, to me, that's as good as we've gotten at that. My question kind of piggybacks on Ambassador Litz, and I was just wondering, in your experience, if at all, um, how has the U.S.'s use of civilian contractors for building partner capacity and delivering FID training impacted the international community's perception of our commitment to those efforts? This is the State Department, I don't know, um, it's the State Department's model, of course, to have implementing partners, which is a contracted uh, force. I know, um, for example, in, in Somalia and Eastern Africa, that's been heavily um, relied on there. It's, of course, no secret to those who've been out there or have studied it, we don't have there's no military model for training police. The special operations guys have raised some high-end kind of paramilitary forces, but community policing and, and local police, we've done it late, we've done it poorly, we have no you know, real organized trained force to do that. Um, so the reliance on various contracted formula has been the default, except when we can get the Italians or the Australians who have national police and programs uh, for such training. Um, I, I'm a little bit concerned that what I know of the State Department programs that um, they will often award the contracts without the kind of controls or oversight or based on the wrong criteria. And of course, no one wants to waste taxpayer money, but you also shouldn't just be going for the cheapest entity either. So it's a very difficult uh, thing. The reliance on contractors is a fact. Um, we do it, but I, th I would much rather see more work done uh, to perfect, and I think policing is really the main gaping hole, uh, to try to work on some other solutions there that would have some fieldable um, police, uniform police forces to provide on the ground oversight of anything contractors are doing. And I don't, you know, I don't want to stick an eye in the, poke a stick in the eye of the people who are out there doing a good job, but I, I saw a lot of people that weren't very well prepared uh, for the environment um, and the context in which they were operating. So simply having policing skills uh, isn't the answer. Chuck. Chuck Allen, United States Army War College. A uh, quick question here. Well, ask, uh, Senator, uh, Secretary S. Carter unveiled his uh, third offset strategy from DOD. How do you convey that, uh, connect that to the strategic competence you're talking about needed for our nation? Uh, we had a series of uh, secretaries of uh, services meet with CSIS about two weeks ago, talking about their programs, what they're trying to do. And that's on the institutional side rather than the war fighting side. Well, Chuck, as usual, you know how to stump your students. Now, I, I have to say, I think I look at the uh, third offset as an important and valuable part of how the nation's trying to deal with a world of pro proliferating threats, new threats, not so new threats. I didn't talk about the big five, but I think this is a moment where we have to have grand strategy. We have to understand which of these, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, Islamic State and what will come after it and its ilk because that is just a phenomenon. I've been mo mo mostly uh, devoted my uh, career to the, the non-state realm, soft operations and these um, the counterinsurgency field. I believe the third offset is a useful way of looking at our competitive advantage, which is we're a wealthy country and how do we invest in next generation uh, technologies, but I, I guess what I would refer you back to is our report clearly shows me as a non-hardware person, and you'll get this in spades also from General Mc, McMaster. I think the strategic challenges of our day are not answered through technology. Uh, not to say we shouldn't do the investment and we shouldn't be looking for 
for that next offset. Uh, and there are other far more competent technologists and, and people with expertise in that realm. I just hate to see, and I think this is where I very much do agree with General uh, McMaster. I mean, I have tremendous regard for him. Uh, I, I think that, I mean, we don't always agree. We often disagree, actually, but I think it is very important that we keep our eyes squarely focused on the human nature of war because I think where time and again we have failed is not through our lack of firepower, technical, we have overmatch, you know, I just, I think that it's good to be looking long term and certainly in cyber and some other realms we're missing, but what catches us up is thinking that we can fight and win the nation's wars without winning the peace. And that's what I see being lost. And I also think, yes, we have to choose when and where to go in, but I do believe, and I believe we'll, we'll have some debate um, about this with, with others, I think the so-called small footprint approach is the way to go. There are too many problems out there in the world that can't be ignored. I think we need to really perfect our methods for going in and finding those reliable actors, finding those structures that can be worked with and empowering them. Will they be perfect? No. Uh, do we want to resort to rank expediency? No. Uh, but I think we have to get some of these models firmly enshrined. And frankly, I was very disappointed when I saw the, the Army announce with great fanfare the regionally aligned forces, only to find it become a Potemkin uh, kind of thing. I also think the Security Force Assistance Brigades being on the slow track is another sign of lip service without really understanding. We have got to get really good at going in there. And also, it's not just us. The bank shot is France is taking a lot of the load in North Africa. We are looking you know, to some combination of partners. We, Libya is a bleeding sore that cannot be ignored. You know, we, we have too many problems and not enough uh, men and women in uniform. And I would not advocate for sending 100,000 troops anywhere in any event. So I pivoted. You got that? <laughs> so. Linda, I think you accomplished your mission of making the bridge between many of the issues we discussed today to many of the issues we're going to get into tomorrow. They are interrelated. Strategy, arguably, is the most important. Get strategy right, the rest will fall out. We've won a lot of battles. We've demonstrated some operational victory. But maybe this strategic competence is something that needs further study and further development. So thank you very much for your kind remarks. On behalf of the superintendent, the Corps of Cadets, the staff and faculty, uh, please accept this small token of appreciation for your great comments. And we're looking forward to some more interaction tomorrow. Thank you so much. Let's give her another round of applause. Thank you.